All right, so last class of the semester, right? I mean, last lab, last time you see me. Uh, well, not necessarily. You can always see me, right? I have a YouTube channel. You can always <laughs> come and see me whenever you want. Um, so what do we talk about today? Today, finally, we get to the third part of this three-part story we started two weeks ago, right? So uh, why I'm excited? Because today we're going to be talking about something I've done research about, maybe a little bit. I mean, I contributed to, okay? Uh, and so let me restart with the same slide for the third time, such that we get from the starting point, right? And so we had an action plan. We talk about the first time uh, about model predictive control, right? So we saw how we can do, uh, we can compute, we can perform back propagation through the kinematics equation uh, of, you know, a, a vehicle. And then we saw that we are going to be minimizing the uh, cost, energy, whatever, with respect to the latent. Actually, let me show you what I was doing these days. Remember, Jan um, yeah, was telling you about the Kelly Bryson algorithm. I also told you told you a little bit about this, and that it was used for sending things on the on the uh, in orbit, right, to send a space shuttle, I think, on the moon. So. Then I said, oh, can I do the same? Well, I don't know if I can do the same. So I just started, right? So how are um, planets attracted by other things, right? By gravitational law. So this is the gravitational law. Then I just started playing a little bit with physics. I mean, not big deal, right? I just wrote a few equations. Uh, well, I just started with this one, right? This is like how you should be um, eager to just try out things, right? So if you have an idea, just try it out, right? Unless you put yourself on the on the computer, no, and try something. You you really cannot see if this goes anywhere, right? And so again, here I just define a body uh, which has an initial position, initial velocity, a mass, um, and then I define this uh, equation here, which are defining basically the state, um, the state equation, right? The state transition uh, equations for my uh, item, right? And then in this case, I initialized uh, two planets, basically. Uh, the blue one has a hundred times, uh, is more, is hundred times more massive than the red, red one. And the red one has an initial velocity. I can show you here, right? So the, um, the blue one here has a mass of 100. There is no unit here. Uh, this is, I will change this. And then it has an initial posi uh, position 0, 0, a velocity 0, 0. The other one instead is an initial position of 10, 0, right? So it starts at 10. And then I gave it uh, initial velocity, right? So then it starts orbiting around. And then it basically drags <laughs> the blue one around. Anyway, so then I was trying within this uh, uh, kind of environment to have to control something. No, I haven't yet started. but. The point is that you should be able to have, well, we gave you a vocabulary, right? We have, we gave you a toolkit of things you can play with, right? So if you're cur curious, you should be curious. You should try to do things that you like, no? Why things that you like? Because you're going to put effort and then something's going to come out eventually. Anyway, this is just side project. I haven't done much there. Anyway, we were doing the recap, right? So I was going to play with a Kelly Bryson algorithm for these two things here. Then we saw in the second lesson about this uh, thing, uh, that was like uh, last week, we saw the track vector upper, uh, how we were learning an emulator of the kinematics from observation. This is because we don't necessarily have those update equations, right? I started from physics again for this gravitational problem. Uh, because I wanted to see whether I remember how things work. Uh, they actually are working uh, fine, but let's say those uh, equations are always going to be approximate, right? So instead, what you observe is going to be definitely what actually happens. So that's why we may need to learn, right? The kinematics, which has all these additional parameters that I might have uh, neglected, right? Let's say friction, let's say, I don't know, whatever. Um, you can always add additional terms, right? But then if you actually learn something from observation, it's going to be exactly that. Right? You don't miss things because you didn't think about, right? It doesn't need you to have domain knowledge. That's important. 
Then we saw that we were uh, able to train a policy. Well, I told you we can. I didn't show you actually what's working uh, last time. Well, I'll show you the other example. Someone make it work on GitHub. And finally, today, the third part. So PPUU planning and uh, prediction and planning under uncertainty. So this is the, you know, holy grail. No, maybe not. But it has like the combination of all different things we talk across the semester, right? So... One of the things, actually, I even haven't told you how uh, DALI was working, right? I told you during the generative network lesson that there was this DALI, which is generating uh, those very realistic, very cute, if you want, uh, images given a caption. I didn't, didn't tell you how it works. And no one actually complained. You should complain more, right? Like um, intellectually complain. Like if I didn't tell you things, you should be eager to know how things work, right? So... You should ask how does it work, so and then I can tell you because also I forget things. Right? I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm forgetful. I'm not on purpose forgetful. Right? Anyway, I tell you later. So today we are going to be talking about stochastic environment. Uh, what does it mean? There is other stuff moving on around. Like there is. We are not alone, right? Uh, we are not just alone. Like yeah, okay, double meaning. Right? The the, the point is that there is other stuff we don't control. And if other agents come into play in our environment, then um, then you cannot really know what's going to be, right? And they are not necessarily predictable if they have free will or whatever. So we're going to be introducing that. Then we're going to have a uncertainty minimization, basically to avoid uh, going in areas that we don't necessarily know how things work. Meaning, be careful if you don't know what you're doing. Kind of. And third one is going to be like some important part we already mentioned a few times, that is this latent decoupling, like how to avoid uh, the latent to actually capture too much of this uh, final uh, output. Okay. Ready? Go. No. Okay. Let, let's switch slide. Next, next deck of slides. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about this article that uh, we wrote. Uh, well, Michael wrote together with myself and, of course, Jan. So this is the model predictive policy learning with uncertainty regularization for driving intense traffic. Again, all maybe weird terms that we're going to be uh, understanding for sure by the end of the class. Okay. So on the right hand side, I'm going to just show you a slightly different notation uh, because this is actually a few years old now, the, the, the slides, so they are not matching the last one, but and also it was, it's already made a presentation, so we didn't change because it's already, it's, you know, I just tell you about something I've done. So in this case, I'm going to call the state S of T, right? We call it X of T. In control, it's called X, bold X, pink bold X, right? Should have been. Uh, on the right hand side, instead, we have an action AT, which we call UT, right? Bold, orange. Uh, u actually function of time uh, and you know we we know that since it's orange it's a latent right so the u uh, control or z uh, latent or in this case a for action so all of them are interchangeable symbols using different type of uh, fields and and circumstances right so this is more of the notation you would be uh, encountering if you're doing reinforcement learning actually right so state with s action with the a c for a cost or actually the user reward we don't use rewards so we don't do reinforcement learning but we are using now uh, perhaps a little bit of notation from that field okay Anyway, we have this agent, no? this agent that can take. So what is the agent? The agent is something that can take decisions, actions, ATs, given that it finds itself in a given uh, circumstance, uh, in a given state, ST. And given that it performs an action, it's going to be observing some C, some consequences, okay? some cost. Okay. How do we observe this stuff? Well, we are basically acting in a real world, right? So you're going to be performing actions. And given that the world was finding itself in a given state, you perform an action, like let's say you move forward, then the world will change its state correspondingly. It's going to provide you to you the next state, and then also what is the cost associated to your action. Again, this is something I guess you already seen, or but it's a different, explain a different manner. So I still go through. 
So then in RL, there is this difference between model based and model free. What are the, what's the difference on the model free? You're going to be learning by experiencing with the real world. So the right, right hand side, whereas the model base instead, you're going to be not experiencing thing, but you actually think things through, right? You should always think through things, right? Things through. Don't, don't just act and try, oh, I got burned. No, you shouldn't get burned first, right? Just be, be careful, right? Like, so if you know that the, the, the fire is hot, then just don't put your finger in the fire. Otherwise, we'll burn. Anyway, the point is that here we are going to be using a model of the world in order to be doing this, this thing we've been uh, doing for the last two lessons, which is going to be back, back propagation through time. In this a chain uh, between agent or policy or controller and the word model or um, forward model or state update equations, right? Cool. So model base, right? So how do we learn this model? We already seen this stuff last week. Uh, we have a real world. We share the initial condition, the initial state, ST, at t equals zero. And then we provide a given action to both the real world and the, the, and the emulation of the world, right? This action last time were basically random, right? Random degrees of like random steering angles for the wheels. Um, it can also be action performed by some expert uh, agent, expert drivers, perhaps if we are driving. Uh, and then we are going to be collecting on the right hand side, both the state, the outcome, right? And the consequences, the cost CT. And all we are doing is going to be just regression and try to match what is the outcome of the real world with our, uh, you know, our own emulator of the real world, right? And so here we are learning the world model, the, the, the model it's called, usually. We know already this stuff, just repeat. Um, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be going slower. So I, I just keep try to keep the pace. So model base. Um, in our case, in this case, we remove this cost CT. The cost CT is not provided by, um, in this case, it's not provided by the word, but it's going to be a function of the actual output state of the, the state itself, right? So we, we imagine now that the cost is actually a differentiable function of this state. So we have this model predictive control. We have been talking for the last two weeks ago. So we have this given state from the uh, on the left hand side, and we have the action that's going to be taken by the agent. We provide the action to the word model, and then we're going to be computing a cost CT on top of which one is the state in which we find ourselves. Okay, so that's our current configuration. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about the data, right? So we started saying that uh, we are going to be introducing now a stochastic uh, environment. What does it mean? So here we basically have uh, cameras mounted, like seven cameras mounted on, a, on, on top of a 30 story building facing a highway uh, piece, right? The I-80 highway. So here you can see that there are, you know, these different cameras oriented in different uh, orientations. Right? So you have also this kind of uh, distortion, right? From, from the acquisition part. Then we, uh, I perform a rectification. So basically I change the point of view from top down, from like side view to top down. Of course there are distortions, like because uh, things are assumed to be on the street plane. And so uh, buses and other things get all distorted, but that's you know what we get. And I perform a, a, a sorry localization of these vehicles, right? You can see there are bounding boxes all around. Not only localization, but also regression of the uh, length and width of these vehicles. So you can see the bus, uh, well, the, the track on the left hand side, the red track, or on the, the in the middle, you can see the uh, the pickup track. No. So now, given that I found these bounding boxes, I can you know create a virtual simulator, uh, which has basically, I replace uh, the images and pixels, whatever, with this kind of uh, synthetic uh, image, right? So this is the first time we see uh, in this course a synthetic image, I think, at least in my labs. Uh, the top one are natural images, right? They have a given specific statistics. 
the image right now that I show you are not natural images, right? Uh, how do we, do we get from top-down view, camera projection? Uh, that, that's simply computer vision. You can go in a, um, a open CV and then there is like uh, projections, right? So it's just, it's just like a, a, a deformation, right? You just apply a matrix. So it's just a, a fine transformation, okay? No, no big deal. So you can you can recover what are the affine transformation um, coefficients uh, given that you know the orientation of the camera. Uh, so the, the camera the camera parameters. Okay. Cool. So uh, uh, I, I converted this into this view for the user, in which every car has a label, right? So every car uh, has its own label. I can track uh, all the positions over time, right? Uh, and you can see here on the left hand side, you still have this uh, red track, right? And you can see uh, in the middle the pickup track as well. And then uh, on the on the right hand side, you can see the, you can see the bus, right? Cool. So here I'm going to be introducing two new variables, right? So for every time step, for every discrete time step t, I'm going to have a vector p. I know here these vectors are not bold, right? So this is already bothering me. I know I wrote this stuff, but um, yeah, we decided not to use bold. Also, we, use the, we decided to use uh, RL type of notation. So this is not, I don't like it too much right now. Okay. But anyway, you, you know already this stuff. I mean, I, you know what I like or what I don't. Uh, so PT is going to be the position out of each uh, vehicle, right? So uh, each vehicle at time, uh, discrete temporal index T is going to have a vector PT, right? So how many components does PT have? Answer my question. I'd like to see whether you're following so far. So PT is a vector. How many components does PT have? That's a straightforward question. It's no, no tricks. Tell me. Someone type something, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there is going to be X and, and X and Y, right? So two components. And then VT is going to be the velocity, exactly, at the uh, given temporal index, discrete temporal index T, right? So it's going to be VX, the, the, the X direction, and the Y direction. So we have basically, over time, you're going to be ending up with a trajectory of locations and velocities, no? basically vectors that are telling you in which direction you're going. Uh, and the, the velocity, the speed. Um, and so we have trajectories now, cool, for each, uh, for each vehicle. Moreover, and this is interesting now, I also get the action AT. So can you guess how I got this AT? AT is gonna be the actions that the possibly uh, expert drivers took in the, in the car. So. How did I get the actions from this camera view? So did I did I go in the car? Uh, change in the x and y. Yeah. So basically, I inverted the kinematic model of the tricycle we we saw two weeks ago, and by inverting the by observing you know by having the whole trajectory, I can extract what were the actions that were taken in order to get to that position, right? So you can tell what is the acceleration, right? If your speed uh, changed, no, the, the magnitude of the velocity change, you know that there is like change in acceleration. Uh, if you change the orientation of that vector, there is no, some, some turning, so exactly. Cool, so I in, these ATs are coming from the inversion of the kinematic model. Of course, this didn't come out, uh, it was not too straightforward because there were jitters, right? So what are jitters? So sometimes the bounding boxes were <laughs> moving like this direction. So the car is moving like this, well, from, 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 from left to right. But then sometimes there is like a one pixel up or one pixel down. So what happens if your car moves sideways and your model is the tricycle model? <laughs> it happens that it cannot happen, right? So you, you're going to get like the, the kinematic model will give you bad numbers, like plus infinities or something like that, right? Um, and, and so then you start, you had to introduce some Kalman filtering and so on, right? So there, there, it, there is so much more behind engineering that goes on, right? So there is things that I tell you right now and things I didn't, I don't tell you because there is so much 
you know, getting things to actually work. But anyway, moving on. So here we, we have now, we introduce actually, so the, the intermediate one was like a user-friendly representation, which I have numbers and so on. Finally, I'm gonna create those that are the data that I'm gonna be feeding to my model. And in this case, I decided to go with a RGB um, representation. Why RGB? Because I didn't use the correct tools. And so I only had RGB channel, which is wrong. We should, I should have used a better uh, encoding tool, okay? So in this case, I just draw things with a, a game, a pie, pie game, right? Pie, what's it called? The yeah, pie game is called, I think. Um, which allows me only to draw in, in three colors, right? But if I want to encode one more layer, then you shouldn't be using that, right? Anyway, uh, here we have that each car is going to be represented with this uh, green box, right? And then you have, you know, the pickup truck in the center or the bus over there. The lanes are going to be shown here as red lines, right? So the, each channel has a meaning. And then I basically crop a context image, which is that uh, rectangle you can see here around each vehicle, right? And so each vehicle now will have not only its position, not only its velocity, but it will also have this uh, window of pixels, basically, which is you know uh, oriented with myself, which is following me, which is going to be letting me know what is the configuration of the lanes in that specific uh, region and the configuration of the traffic, right, of the other vehicles around me. And so basically, per each vehicle at each timestamp, you're going to be having a context image, right? And I also move myself from the green channel to, let's say, the blue channel in this case. So I don't, uh, I can differentiate myself uh, from the others, right? And so I have all these types of context images, right? They tell me what's the situation around it. And so you can see, for example, in the center, we had the pickup trap there, right? And then since it was slightly turned to the left, you're going to see that all lanes are slightly tilted to the right hand side. Or you can see the bus in the top right corner there. And so these are my images, IT, or perhaps observations, if we, if we want to call it, okay? And so, Eventually, the collection of position, velocity, and context images is going to be making my state at time, uh, discrete temporal index t. Okay? And so this is like my, my you know, uh, the, the stochastic environment we're going to be dealing with right now. The state is made of a collection of tensors, right? So it's a set. It's not even more a vector or a tensor. Anyway. Uh, so what I had to tell you, we, we told you, I told you about the state. Now I have to tell you how I compute the cost on top of this state. So let's say you're driving, right? So when you're driving, what, what are you going to try to do? What, what, do you, what, what do you want to do when you drive to survive a, you know, a, if you go from point A to point B? Tell me. Oh, okay, someone asked, saying, see. So no crashes, reach the destination, correct? And also try to stay within the lane, perhaps, right? Don't don't go, <laughs> don't go crazy. Exactly. So now I'm gonna be uh, computing a differentiable cost of the state, which is telling me how costly a given state is. Basically, how close I am to other vehicles, or how far from the center of the lane I am. Right. So this is what I came up with, which is not necessarily right, but it actually did work. So we go for this right now. Cost, first part. So the left-hand side, I'm gonna be telling you about the lane cost. And then on the right-hand side, I'm gonna be telling you about the proximity cost. So on the left side, you see that there is this lane with uh, triangle, which is centered within myself, right? Within my own blue vehicle. Now, if you embed this within the lanes, so you're gonna be seeing that if I am not within the center of the lane, then there is going to be some overlap, right? And the overlap is going to be my cost. So in this case, I just do the multiplication of this triangle, no, this kind of uh, envelope, no envelope, yeah, this kind of envelope with this red channel, right? So it's a, a pixel-wise multiplication, right, of these two sh shapes. 
and then I take the max basically, right? So you have zero, 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 you get this value, then it's going to be zero, 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 zero. And then I just take the, the max, which is this X here. If my blue vehicle is going to be exactly in the center of the lane, there is going to be no overlap between the red, red uh, color and the, and, and the aqua color, okay? I hope it makes sense. On the right hand side, we're gonna have something similar, but for other vehicles. So I still have this, you know, uh, transverse cost now, which has more or less, uh, which is a, a width of the, the lane width, which is basically telling you, oh, if you're a lane apart from your neighbors, uh, cars on this, on the, on the left and the right, then you're okay, right? And then I have also a longitudinal type of cost which is going to be telling me how I can, how close I can be to the preceding and following vehicle, right? In this case, the safety distance, which is the extent in which this cost propagates, like uh, is, a, you know, happen to be within the X direction, which is the direction of motion, is going to be depending on the speed. In this case, it's actually linearly depending, so dependent. So if I go very slow, I'm gonna have a smaller safety distance. If I go faster, I need more time to be able to break. So I'm gonna be having a longer safety distance. Um, there are some numbers, like usually it's like one second uh, at a given speed. Cool. So how do we uh, embed this in the uh, in the environment? So we have that, uh, like I, I just put myself basically turning on the left hand side and there is this vehicle in front of me. So you can see here, there is a very high cost associated to this transverse cost. But then on the longitudinal cost, maybe it's further down on the slope. And so what is gonna be my final cost? My final cost is gonna be the product of the two. And then, uh, Basically, I take the max of the product of the two, such that if in one case is zero, you know, it, it means that if I am uh, exactly to the side of this one, of this vehicle, I will have zero transverse cost. And even if I am exactly on the maximum part, it's gonna be having the maximum value times zero. So it doesn't, doesn't matter. Or in the other case, if I am exactly behind this vehicle and my uh, transverse cost is the maximum, but I'm further away. Well, if I'm further away, then the product is going to be still zero. So it's, so it's also fine. Okay. So I take the max of the product of the two. Cool. So how do I actually do this in practice? Well, let's have a look here on the left hand side. You're going to see a situation where everyone actually where my, my blue car, my ego car is moving at 20 kilometers per hour. And on the right hand side, instead, you're going to see a similar situation where my speed is actually 50 kilometers per hour. Because as you can tell, there is like a larger distance between all the vehicles. Uh, on the left hand side, I'm going to be showing you the outer product of this longitudinal transverse proximity cost, which is coming up to be that small yellow blob. Uh, which is highest value is going to be one in the yellow region. And then the purple is going to be telling you it's zero. On the right hand side instead, since we go at a faster speed, you're going to have that the, um, the safety distance is going to be lo longer, right? larger. And so you're going to have that the extent of this mask of this kind of, uh, you know, shape, whatever you want to call it is longer, right? Such that now it picks up things that are further away. Nevertheless, the extent in the transverse direction is going to be the same, right? You still look at this, you know, regardless of the speed, I still want to be one lane away from the neighbors. Cool. So here you can see uh, how the difference in uh, ex uh, extension, uh, what is what is the difference in extension? And it is differentiable, right? So what is differentiable? Whenever I co compute the cost, I said I multiply this mask, now this uh, purple to yellow mask, which is a zero to one, uh, you know, basically grayscale one layer, I multiply with a green channel of this uh, image, context image, right? So you had the green channel, which have the content represents all the green vehicles, right? All the other vehicles, uh, that green is, is gonna be one and non-green non is gonna be basically zero. You multiply by this mask, right? You take the max, then that's gonna be my cost, right? So if you are very, very, very close to a vehicle, there's going to be a very high cost. Look, uh, you know, if I'm far from everyone, then it's okay. Uh, low cost. And so this is the cost. 
and the previous one we saw the state so should be okay right you already know everything more or less you should be able to uh you know to put this stuff together right let's see so what are the necessary steps to put everything together well there are three major steps and this is the outline of today talk so we took the first half an hour to introduce the talk and everything then we're gonna have a talk maybe now for the next 30 minutes if i finish on time so first we're gonna be trying to learn the word model from the we said the real world right this whatever i define it right now we try to mimic this real world with this uh, regressor so we go from the real green world to this blue cartoon second point is going to be going from the cartoon transfer or extract knowledge to uh, train this policy right to train this brain the agent finally guess what we're gonna finish the circle we're gonna be having we put the brain in the environment and we're gonna be interacting right so there is a full cycle the, the green to the blue, blue to the pink, pink to the green, right? So we can be doing the evaluation. All these points can be, you know, worked further. And this is just, I'm going to be going through each of them right now. Ready? Go. The word model predicting what's next, given history and action. So we have this word model. And I, again, I had to apologize in this case because I'm going to be using a uh, different notation from the bullet points we've been introducing because again, this stuff is old and my understanding just recently uh, improved. So not graphs and charts and things are slightly not consistent today. I, 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 I ask, I, I, I say, I apologize. Okay. All right. Uh, so we had this word model, which should be a bullet point, like a bullet uh, diagram, right? Which is oh, still a circle, right? Okay, so at least this one is the same. So we have a state going from 1 to t. Uh, what, what does it mean, 1 to t? So if you only have, uh, in order to be able to capture uh, the whole situation, given that we have speed, uh, and position, we made, we could just need one point, right? Uh, if you want, if you just have access to position, then you may need two points, right? So if you have two points, you can have location and speed, right? But now we have also other vehicles, right? And so if we want to tell what's the speed of these vehicles, we need two images, right? Now, uh, image now and image before. But then if you want to change whether they are accelerating or you know breaking then you need three images right so if you want to tell acceleration you may want three images nevertheless here we just take a t number of previous frames in order to have the uh, complete view of the history right or at least a uh, reasonably complete view of the history right this is kind of a very common approach and then we the word model is going to be also getting this uh, action a t this control on the other side, what we're going to be asking is going to be doing a prediction, which is going to be our S tilde, which now is called S hat here. But again, it's S tilde, which is our prediction. And again, the colors are orange. Don't, 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 don't care about the colors. Okay. This should be these, uh, the violet color. Anyway. Uh, so these are my predictions. The real world, what does it do? Well, the real world gives me basically the observations. Then those are the blue. Okay. The Y is the, the blue targets. Okay. If that's correct. All right. Cool. So let's train this, right? Why, 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 why should be hard, right? So what am I using? So I have my state here and the action. I'm going to be using a predictor, right? That's uh, what we've been calling this. The predictor gives me the hidden representation of the future. And then I'm going to have a decoder which is gonna be giving me my prediction, huh? which is, should be this S still the, the, the predicted version. On the other side, I'm gonna have the, uh, the target, the Y, no? my, my blue Y. And then I'm gonna be having in between this energy uh, block, no? which should, should be a red square, which is our spring no? that is trying to get the prediction close to the target. Okay, cool. Uh, is it gonna be working? Tell me, does it work? Yes, no. Just using a predictor decoder network to predict the future, right? What do you guess? Does it work? Does it not work? 
No one says anything. Just play with me. Uh, yes, but the noise may be an issue. Yes, exactly. That's a very big uh, point. It's, you're very correct, right? So let's see how it works or it doesn't, right? So here we go. So we're going to have the directional motion. The is going to be going from bottom to top. On the left hand side, you see the actual future and what is actually happening. And on the right hand side, you're going to see this deterministic model. OK, the frame rate is going to be 10 frames per second. And again, you, you see the timestamp, the discrete time index T on the top right corner. Okay? So here we go. You can see that after basically uh, four seconds, things get very blurry. And then now we are like basically at 10 seconds, things are completely unrealistic and nothing works. And so Alfredo sucks. Mm, maybe. Okay. No, maybe it's not my fault. Maybe it is. I don't know. But nothing works, right? So what, what, what's the problem here? As Jan pointed out, the noise and issue, right? The, more than the noise, the uncertainty, right? So if you have multiple outputs and you don't have, if you try to train with the MSC, then you will not be able to capture multiple outputs, right? So how do we fix this? I already told you this like 10 times already <laughs> so far. How to possibly have multiple outputs given, yeah, it's, we are going to be using an energy model. Which type of energy model? You already know the answer, right? The, what's the full thing? Mm, da -da, energy model, no? Energy business model. There's something before. <laughs> Two more words. How to possibly have multiple outputs given one single input? We need a, it's correct, your answer, Camila, but you need to add two words more. Yeah, one to many. How to do that? It's called, we know this answer, right? Yes, we do. Mm, mm, it's in orange. What's in orange? <laughs> latent variable, yeah, hooray. Yes, correct. So we just need latent variables, right? Here we were trying to learn a multimodal distribution given that we don't have latent. Well, nothing works. Of course, nothing works, right? There we go. So, okay, the issue is this one, but we already know everything. So this is a pencil. You, you leave a pencil, fold it down. What happens? So let, let me draw from top down because I cannot draw things, uh, you know, <laughs> with a projection. So I, I have a pencil. I, I make it fall in many directions. Uh, every time you're going to get basically the, 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 the rubber, no, the, the tip is going to be going in different directions. You try to learn this with an MSC. Well, you just learn the average, right? Of course, we already learned, right? So if you have the temperature that goes to plus infinity, the limit for beta goes from zero to zero, right? It's going to be the average, right? Of all those things, which don't work. We know that, right? Cool. So what's the average image? Tell me, it's a blur image, right? It has everything inside. Uh, in the right hand side here, I just show you the average coordinate. It's going to be the zero, zero in this case, right? But in the other case, since we have pixels, you just get a pixel blur, right? Blur is average. Uh, I hope you know this stuff, right? I, it should be okay. All right. So how do we fix it? Well, you told me we add latent variables, right? So we can have a variational predictive network. Yay. So what do we do? Well, we add a Z, ZT. Oh, of course, ZT should be in orange, right? So all the colors here are wrong, okay? <laughs> so ZT, at least the letters are correct, should be a low dimensional latent variable, right? So it should be a bold orange ZT, which goes inside an expander, which is just a linear module that is making dimensions correct. And then I sum this latent to what is the hidden representation given to me by the predictor should be okay, right? Despite being wrong colors, everything is fine here. Cool. So where do we get this latent ZT? Well, we saw in a few lessons ago, we can use a variational uh, something, right? So here I'm going to be encoding my uh, ST plus one inside uh, with this encoder, which is going to be giving me uh, the mu and, and uh, sigma square, right? The, 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 the mean and the variance of this possible distribution of Z. And then we sample, right? With these values, right? And so the right hand side here, 
it's going to be variational out encoder, right? I have the input, I have the encoder for the parameters of the distribution. Here I sample from that Gaussian, I get the Z uh, that goes inside this, you know, up, up sampling, whatever, and then it goes inside the decoder. But it's not just a variational out encoder, it's a conditional variational out encoder, right? Because there is also X, right? So this is my Y, right? This is my Y tilde, and here is my X, right? And so this is not just a variational autoencoder, it's a conditional variational autoencoder. Can you elaborate more about the intuition of the design of the encoder for the latent variable? Uh, this one is simply going to be a convolutional net, right? Which is, uh, so there is two branches. The, inside this guy, there is a convolutional net, which is feeding have been fed with these context images from the states. And there is also an MLP, which is fed with the uh, position and velocity, right? So there is a four dimensional vector, X, Y, V, X, V, Y. And there are RGB, basically context images, which should not be RGB, but they are. And so these are going through a comnet, basically. And this basically looks like a, I would say almost like a classification network which outputs, uh, I think, 16 uh, outputs for the mu and 16 outputs for the log, uh, log sigma square, right? log variance. So that, that's the architecture for inside, if that's what you're asking. I'm not sure if I answer your question. Um, and this, guy, this is going to give me these parameters, right? OK, OK, cool. And so this is going to give me the parameters from which I sample this Z, right? So Z comes from this uh, Gaussian, which has been parameterized by the encoder. Uh, moreover, we need something. So this is going to be usually called the posterior distribution, blah, blah, blah. We didn't talk. I mean, I didn't talk about this stuff because we don't care. And also, of course, there is going to be an additional term, uh, which is the relative entropy, no? the KL. Uh, with the prior. Why do we need the prior? Well, because we have to actually sample later no? on the, <laughs> at the inference, right? Uh, because we don't have access to the future uh, at inference time. So we're going to be sampling from his, this one over here. So inference, how does it work? As we have said, since we have a relative entropy uh, with the prior, now we can simply sample from the prior. Then we're going to get uh, you know, the latent here. We're going to be getting a prediction as uh, you know, whatever this S hat T plus one, then we're going to be feeding this one in the input and we're going to get the second prediction. Then we feed to the input and so on. Okay. So let's look how this stuff works on the left hand side. You see the actual future. The second column is going to be the deterministic future. And then on the, uh, the other four columns here, you're going to be seeing the following. So I'm going to be sampling 200 latent for the first one, 200 latents for the second, 200 latents still from a Gaussian, no? from a normal distribution for the third and fourth. So overall, we have 800 latents, right? Which I just use uh, 200, 200, 200, 200. And so this is how it looks. So pay attention to the, these two vehicles, right? I put them in, the, in a circular, uh, in a circle and then in a square. You can see how they basically show, they display different behavior. Everything is consistent. The deterministic model already died. And the variational, conditional variational encoder just works very well. And then you can see that the basically traffic, uh, you know, the configuration of the other vehicles just changed without any issue. And this stuff just works. Right? This was great. Why did we use a convolutional network? Uh, because pixels are uh, where uh, the, the easiest thing we thought about uh, to encode this position of an arbitrary number of vehicles, okay? We didn't know in, uh, when we wrote this, you know, three years ago, how to deal with sets of inputs. We didn't have transformers yet. Uh, transformers are something very relatively recent, right? So potentially, if we would be doing the same stuff these days, we would be using a, a transformer, which allows us to deal with a set of vehicles that are nearby, right? So this is connecting back to the uh, question to, to that Young, Young asked. So we use you know, a convolutional net because we use images to encode information. These are not natural images. These are uh, synthetic images because that was the most uh, like straightforward thing to do for us, like the most uh, 
there were no other options kind of i mean we tried to 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 in, to, to do some sort of uh, permutation invariance network but we were not smart enough to come up with a solution so that's the answer uh, and you know adding to the answer of the question from before Cool. So everything works. So what next? Well, things are a little bit annoying because now there is a path that goes from the future to my prediction. And unless this ZT has, you know, some sort of constraint, like the, we're going to be figuring out that we're going to be turning to the right just because the latent has captured that information. Like we see all the lanes turning. And so the latent will necessarily reflect that, uh, that everything turns, right? And we don't really care, unfortunately, of what action was actually taken by the agent. And so this basically makes our model insensitive to the actions of the, uh, that we are, we are taking. So this is going to be completely useless, right? If your predictive, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your conditional model is unconditional, well, you can use it in a conditional way, right? So if there is no connection between your condition and the output, if you cannot move the output, given that you move your actions or your condition, then this stuff becomes useless, right? Uh, and this comes, the issue, this, issue, this issue arises from the fact that the latent encodes too much information. So now we have to try to uh, struggle, no struggle, um, well, throttle, what's the English word? You know, uh, <laughs> We have to squeeze out uh, some, we have to limit the information capacity of the latent, right? So otherwise it, it, the model cheats. Throttle, yeah, I guess it's throttle. All right, so let me show you the, the issue here. On the, in this first part here, you're gonna see the real uh, latent and the real action, right? So this is basically uh, reality. And so this is how the car basically steer a few times. You can see the, the lanes moving all around. On the left hand side now, you're going to be seeing instead, uh, this is sped up four times. In this case, you're going to see the real actions, but random, uh, but, uh, but different, uh, set of different set of latent. You can see that it doesn't change in the other case, in the first set and the left hand side, you see the real set of latent, but random actions. You can see now as I'm using the real set of latent. Things were turning, right? Even in this last frame, you can see that the last, in the last case, we were turning left. So everything turned to the right. And in these two images, although the actions are the same, the lanes are not, you know, reflecting such rotation in the left hand side. Instead, you can see that the latent is actually encoding the fact that we are turning, which is not what we want, right? The latent should be only encoding the, uh, what the other vehicles are doing, not my actions, right? I want to decouple this. And so in the next uh, few slides, we're going to be seeing how to do, avoid the fact that the latent are encoding my actions, right? So let me show you again this video. Maybe it's going to be a bit clearer. So here is going to be the reality. I just tear a few times so you can see things turning. In the other cases, uh, on the left hand side, you're going to see the same exactly actions. And so I would expect a similar type of behavior. So we have the same actions, but not things are don't don't change the same way. And instead, in the first column, you're gonna see the same latent, but random actions. You can see how the move the motion of the lanes are very correlated to my original one, right? So these actions basically leaked in the latent, which is was not good news. This stuff took eight months, right, to to make it work. So I mean. Eight months to train the predictive model and then six months to train the policy. So <laughs> took over a year, two people, right? It's like, not, not, it was not easy, but nevertheless, we end up making it work. So again, we have to find out a way to cut this path from the target to my prediction. So how to do that? Well, we introduce this uh, symbol here, which is basically a uh, switch. We already learned about this drawing here. And we basically switch back and forth between the prior and the posterior, which means that we have basically a latent variable dropout. We, we pick up during training, we, we pick sometimes the, the latent from the posterior and the latent from the prior, which means that we don't rely on the 
uh, encoder here, the, the posterior, to actually take predictions, like make predictions that are reflecting different actions, right? Actions can be always here, right? But then the latent might or might not be uh, available. And so the encoder, well, the predictor and the whatever decoder will now have to instead, you know, rely on what is the condition, no? the conditional input to take directions, right? I can no longer rely on this signal. Before there was a signal and now we just broke, you broken the signal. Cool. Does it work? Yeah. So in this case, I'm going to show you on the right, in the right two column, right? Most columns, um, two random choices of latent, right? Two random samples of latent, but the same actions, right? Or the same real actions. You can see here how the lanes are actually all moving uh, synchronously, basically, right? All of them are moving because I'm steering. Whereas on the left-hand side, we didn't see such kind of uh, steering. Cool. So that was the first part. We learned how to train a model of the world given that we have a stochastic environment. Second part of the talk, no? Well, I will have to, I don't know, maybe I had to speed up a little bit, maybe not, because maybe things are easier now. So the agent, we're gonna be trying to distill the knowledge of how to move around all these cars without, you know, crashing, right? So right now we learn how to predict the, the next state, how to learn about the future. Now we're gonna be having to deal with using the future and the cost to navigate this environment. So we already seen this stuff. We already know we're going to be uh, having to use this left-hand side, non planning. Uh, we already know this stuff, so I just skip it completely. So how does it work? We have an agent, which should also be a bullet uh, thing. Uh, sometimes it's called PI. PI stands for policy. This is a controller. It's fed with a state, which is position, velocity, and the context image for the last t temporal uh, steps. And then we're going to be trying to produce this action, a tilde should be whatever, or a check, right? So be a check because it's the action that is minimizing the, uh, the energy, right? And so this is going to be my acceleration brake or steering right and left, okay? Uh, right, so the actions are going to be, remember, right? So the actions in this predictive whatever, no, in the... Uh, optimal control are going to be basically the latent input, right? The control. And then we were doing minimization of the energy with respect to the latent or the actions, right? So these actions that are in theory, the optimal action should be the A check, which are the minimizers of the energy. Here's written A hat because I didn't know about this stuff <laughs> back then. All right. So training the agent, we have a state that goes inside the policy. We got this prediction of the action. We provide state and action to the world model. We also input a latent that comes from the prior. So we already trained the world model, right? So we get to get the next state, which is going to be going inside a uh, loss, uh, which is going to be, for example, in this case, my cost task. What are the cost tasks? Well, now it's going to be just this a linear mixing, no linear combination of the proximity cost and this lane cost. Cool. So then we go inside again the policy with this, you know, next state. We're gonna get the next action. It goes inside the pre uh, predictive model. We're gonna get a new latent from the uh, Gaussian from the normal distribution. We predict the next state, which goes inside the loss. Then you provide the state inside the policy, get the new action that goes inside the forward, the world model. You pick another latent, blah, 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 get the thing, last thing, All right? So does it work? Answer. No. <laughs> Why doesn't it work? Because of course things don't work immediately, right? So uh, you put also that in the loss, right? So here we have a loss for every, uh, we have a cost actually at each temporal interval, in each temporal index, right? We, like we saw this two weeks ago already. I made a pretty diagram for you. So that's what happened. We basically tried to or kill ourselves here. So all these uh, trajectories end up crashing into other vehicles or we basically run outside the environment, right? Why, why is that? What's, what's happening? Well, yeah, there is like suicidal intent of our policy, right? 
basically the uh, minimization of the cost was happening whenever we were taking crazy actions. Uh, so basically the policy was breaking the predictive model by coming up with some adversarial actions, which were never observed in reality. And then the predictive model was just output, outputting black. So black is low cost. And so that's awesome. You, you achieved you achieve the lowest energy, the lowest cost. No, you were you, basically the policy was breaking my predictive model, right? So how do we fix that? Well, we need to uh, be able to avoid, you know, crashing and, you know, going off road and crashing. So we perhaps should try to imitate the expert, right? So not just minimizing the cost, which is, you know, getting away from other vehicles and avoid uh, going off road, but then maybe we also try to get close to the what expert driver did right so this is going to be my cost my my loss now is going to be the the cost task plus a expert regularization right so we also try to not deviate too much from what it was the original trajectory from that given vehicle okay so how do we do that? Well, we additionally add this target right to my future predictions, right? So now I'm going to be saying the new predictions should not go too far from what were the actual uh, next states taken by the expert. So I add an another spring, another cost, right? There is another square, red square, another energy term, which is not letting me go too far from where I uh, wanted to, where original the original vehicle went. But now we are adding this additional latent. So we, we try to go for a specific option, but now we are trying to go as close as possible to what happened in the past. So the way to be, to be making predictions as T plus one, the, the S hat, no, the prediction to the closest to the actual, uh, targets is actually to remove this latent, right? Because if you don't have latent, you're gonna be getting the average prediction, which is on average, the closest to all possible things that happen. And now we are trying to go as close as possible to actually a thing that happened, right? If you pick a latent, you're gonna be diverging and you're gonna be picking some solution, but the easiest way to go to the real solution, to, 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 one, the thing that, to a solution that actually happened, sorry, is to actually not diverge, right? And so this was annoying, right? We train, we spend eight months training this latent variable conditional uh, autoencoder, no? And then I had to remove the latent. I'm like, my heart <laughs> broke, right? Did it work? Yeah, it did work. So <laughs> now, that we, now we don't kill ourselves anymore, but, but, but it's, it's sad, no? Do you agree with me? Is it, isn't it sad? We, we had all this latent and now we turn up the temperature in the oven, all this latent, ah, <laughs> they're all dead, right? I'm like, mm. so do you understand what's happening right now? Yes, no, yeah, heartbroken. So now we, we, we did manage to train that amazing predictive network, which allows us to predict any type of future, right? You, you sample different Zs, you have different type of futures, right? But now in order to actually make the policy work, this is too good of a whatever future, right? I need to constrain the future to be the closest to the thing that actually happened. I cannot really, you know, take other options in, in consideration. So this is like a limitation, I think. And so can we do better? Yeah, we can, right? Because we can, because we have Jan on our side. No, I'm just kidding. No, because we should do better, right? So let's try a different manifold attractor. What am I talking about? So the point here was that we were falling from the manifold. The policy was basically taking actions that were making us go away from our expert region, right? So if this is our region where we can make nice predictions, our policy was coming up with actions which were far away, which were, you know, breaking the system, right? And so here we try to get the actions within the realm of actions that were taken by the expert and therefore were within our confident area, our confident space. Um, 
But can I do something similar without necessarily being tied tied to the actual action from the expert? Can I still be within here without having to copy the expert, without doing this imitation learning? Can we? What did I tell you about last week? Could, could there be some benefit from using a policy that breaks our model to help train the model to learn hard areas? Um, so I don't have access to the real, uh, to the real data, right? So I'm, I don't have a simulator of reality. This would work if you have, you know, RL, but here I'm actually training my, uh, world model from observations, right? I have observations only from expert drivers. I don't have the ability to take new actions and observe what the new outcomes are. Okay, we are not doing RL here. We are not uh, trying things in reality. We only observe things. And now we try to train a policy from observational data only. This is very important. We are doing machine learning. We are doing deep learning. We are not doing trial and error. We are not doing, uh, we are not doing RL, okay? So what did I teach you last week? You remember the last five minutes of class? Were you with me? Tell me, what, what did I tell you about yes, yesterday? Well, last, last week. Yeah, dropout variance. What is that stuff? That allows us to understand how far you are from your training manifold, right? From your data manifold. So let's use that here. Right? So let's introduce a notion of distance in the uh, state space. Okay, And this is going to be our solution to our uh, problem here. And it works amazingly well. Okay. And so let's see how we can, uh, we can, we can in introduce, we can, uh, yeah, introduce this model for our model uncertainty. So we have our for our model. We have our specific cost. And then here is going to be, let's say, my cost. The point is that within the region where I'm trained, all the points are the red points. But then what happens outside is that predictions are arbitrary, right? And so now we can compute the variance across the predictions and we can automatically estimate what is the uncertainty with which a prediction is made. We, we've seen this. We can do that with ensemble of models or we can do this with the variance uh, computation over the dropout uh, output, right? During the inference. So we introduce now this uncertainty regularization. Cool. So we have our predictive, uh, our policy, which is feeding our world model. And then we have different, uh, we have one latent, right? Which is giving my, my prediction as hat t plus one. And then we had the cost there, which is my proximity and lane cost. But then inside in this uh, dashed line, I have multiple dropout masks, right? I, I forward the same latent and the same state and the same action multiple times with different latent variables, with, sorry, with different dropout masks, which is going to give me, of course, different type of predictions, right? Then I can compute the variance and then I have an estimate of which is the, which is the uncertainty with which a prediction is made, right? And so then I have a multiplier, a lambda, and then that is going to be in total, like this is going to be uh, modeling my uncertainty. And then I sum the two. And I'm going to have my loss to optimize in order to find the parameters for the pi. So all together, same diagram, we have latent, we don't kill them. We don't turn the temperature anymore to, to hot, right? These two are all alive. They are thriving. And now my cost is going to be my cost task. Uh, that is the proximity and then plus the, uh, uncertainty regularization. Does it work? And here we go. So the or the pink one are showing you uh, more. Basically, they give the, the the controller more more freedom, right? Now we can decide to take actions which are completely different from the actions that the expert took for that particular trajectory, right? So given uh, we had a given vehicle before in the ye uh, yellow one, we are, we are basically tied to take actions which were consistent with the actions taken by um, more or less by the expert. How, how's that? We were forcing 
our next predictions to be as close as possible to the next states we observe in the trajectory. And so that one automatically was bringing our controller, our policy to take actions which were going to bring us in similar states, limiting ourselves to safe actions, basically only. Uh, or, well, not only to safe action, but it's a subset of safe actions. It's going to be the safe, act safe actions that were actually observed for that specific trajectory. Now, we enlarge the bubble of safe actions to all possible actions that are not going to be messing with my predictive model, right? So now we have, you know, basically you have a spring, right? You, you stay within this bubble. And the spring is going to be uh, given to you by this variance, right? So uh, if the variance is large, then you can go as far as you want, but then you're going to be exiting what is this uh, comfort zone for my predictive model, right? And so the variance, zero variance is going to be the, in the center of the comfort zone of the predictive model. And then you have basically the more you try to take different actions, the more you're going to be increasing this uncomfortable, uncomfortness of the predictive model, right? I think it's super clear, at least now. Uh, from, from whatever we explained to you so far, it should be very clear, although symbols are wrong in this lesson, but whatever. <laughs> it's the last lesson, okay? Forgive me. All right, final part, the evaluation. Given that we have the actions, like the, the policy train, the, the controller, we're going to be trying to see how well or bad it performs, right? So how do we evaluate this stuff? Well, I'll just show you that I'm going to be having this configuration. So in a yellow, I'm going to show you basically what is the original driver, the original uh, observation. In blue, it's going to be my controller, which is taking arbitrary actions, and in green are the other vehicles. I'm going to be running this three times as faster uh, frame rate. So here you can see that we don't necessarily follow the, the, the yellow one. Actually, the, we are going forward and we all the other green vehicles don't see us, right? So we up, got pushed down there and we survived. Again, on the center part, we see that we are always trying to be in the center between uh, two vehicles. And now we accelerate because there is no one in front. And the last part, again, we're going to be seeing that now a vehicle on the bottom is going to be pushing up as up, up there, right? And so all the other green vehicles don't see us anymore, right? Because all the green vehicles are thinking that we are the yellow, yellow guy, right? And so in the first and the third case, we end up diverging from the original trajectory by taking arbitrary actions, actions which, are, which were still safe, but that brought us to different locations, which are now unsafe, I would say, locations because those other vehicles no longer see us because we are replaying what was seen during uh, you know, recording. So this is like a more a, a kind of an adversarial type of situation, right? So other vehicles are just driving as they were, and we try to survive this kind of, uh, you know, kind of multitude of vehicles that no longer see us. Cool. So finally, a recap from the beginning, just to see whether we understand everything, right? So we talk about model predictive policy learning with uncertainty regularization for drive driving in dense traffic. So we talk about model predictive policy learning with uncertainty regularization, especially. Uh, there is this minimization of the variance of the predictions in the uh, action space, right? So we try to take actions that are minimizing the variance. Latent dropout for improving action sensitivity because otherwise there was a leak of information going from the future to our prediction. Then we are using a large scale data set from driving, of driving behavior from traffic cameras. So this is completely from observations. We don't have emulators. We don't have any kind of fake stuff. We just observe real people driving and then we try to learn how to drive within that kind of environment. Finally, I also told you how we can possibly copy the past with this expert regularization, right? If you try to also get to the same states that were reached by the experts. And then uh, what's the question here? How do you how how to how do you think the scale of the data set affect this method? Uh, so 
definitely having larger data sets will help you have like a more robust predictive model uh, like the forward model uh, it's basically always the case that things will happen that you uh, never observe them and so the point is that you en will end up in situations where your predictive model will be unable to clearly tell you what may happen right uh, so the larger the, the the observational data and the data set and the the, the more refined is going to be your forward model given that your forward model is what you use to distill out your policy you know your controller i think it's uh rather important that it has you know it's well uh, trained right i don't know if i answer your question maybe i did and so okay and so finally just a recap of everything you can find more information about this project uh so this is the again prediction and policy learning under uncertainty uh that was me you can find more stuff on twitter of course uh this was an article written basically by uh michael Henaf, a project we work on together for a, over a year and yes jan of course uh, slides, if you want these slides here, over, available over here. There is an article, of course, from iClear, and the code is available in PyTorch on my web, on my GitHub. And then there is a website as well, okay? And there is also a poster. So, with this, we reach the end of class. How, what I should recommend you, right? So now there are final notes, closing notes. So final notes is going to be, uh, you know, the thing that, the, the, that you know, you, you always should be hungry, stay hungry, stay foolish, right? So always be eager to do more and, and find, uh, no, don't, don't, don't get, don't get lazy, right? Just be always wanting to grow more. And there's always space for growing, right? For growth. Uh, how, how do I do that? Well, I always stay on Twitter, for example, to try to learn from the latest thing, right? How do you learn about the latest paper and latest things, right? So we know already that maybe you don't, but now you will do. Uh, there is Yannick, right? So Yannick makes videos of latest papers. And there is this Dino, no? This is very recent paper from uh, Facebook, right? They even include the, the link to the Yannick video on, on their website, right? On the, on the original, on the official uh, GitHub repo, right? So actually there is the... Uh, there is also here the, the latest video, right? So, so you always should be up to date with latest things uh, if you if you want to, you know, succeed in this field. I guess uh, the easiest way is going to be, you know, hang out with the community. Uh, if you need anything, uh, you don't understand something, I'm always uh, here to try to, you know, give an answer. Uh, you can always reach out. Uh, I didn't tell you how DALI was working. That's basically a variational autoencoder, which is uh, condensing an image into smaller, uh, smaller representation. And that's concatenated with some tokens of, a, uh, given, of the given caption. And then everything is just sent through a transformer, which is trained as a language model. And so that was pretty much it. There's no magic. Uh, now, this sentence, I think, should even make sense. And so, uh, you know, if you don't understand something, ask. First, look, at, look it up yourself such that you, you actually show, you try. If you don't get it, you can ask. There is no shame in not knowing. I don't know many things. Uh, as you can tell, I've been changing things throughout the class because I didn't know them before, right? So, but it's okay, right? Uh, no one is perfect. We are here to improve. We are here for learning. Uh, I'm learning because of you, right? If I had to explain things to you, I do have to understand them. And I cannot pretend I understand them because otherwise I don't make sense, right? I hope I do make sense. Um, and so, you know, just let's keep pushing each other forward such that we can all move on. Well, move, not move on, move, move forward, right? All right. So that was it. I hope to see you around, well, virtually, in person, I don't know, depends if this thing stops, uh, this pandemic. Uh, that's it. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, it's been a pleasure, an honor being here uh, for you this semester. Uh, I, I follow, follow up again with these uh, website contributions and things. You can always work uh, like 
we can still always work together on, on more content, right? I love education. You can tell, uh, I hope. <laughs> and so again, if you're interested in this stuff, I'm always, you know, more than happy to partner up and do something together. Okay. All right. Take care. Been over time again. <laughs> it's the last time. <laughs> Let's finish. Take care. Bye. <laughs>